Um, I'm quite curious about chronosphere.io, so I'm really looking forward to this talk and hope you are too. And yeah, stay put and Mary, take it away. Yeah, thank you. So now we just need for this center work, brilliant. So hi everyone, my name is Mary. I'm a software engineer at Chronosphere and today I want to tell you about evolution of deployment tooling at Chronosphere. And a little bit about me and why am I actually talking about deployment tooling. So born and raised in Ukraine, studied there, started my career there. And back in 2017, I moved to Denmark to work for Uber. And that was the first time that I've worked on the infrastructure team and kind of got excited about the area and found it quite fascinating to work with. And then in 2020, I moved to Lithuania to work for Chronosphere, where I also ended up on an infrastructure team. And basically on both infrastructure teams, I eventually ended up working on deployment tooling, learned a lot about it, and that's how I ended up talking about it today. So basically, long story short, when our company was just one and a half years old, we decided that we want to build our own deployment system. And now it's been two years since that moment, and I want to look back at the time and tell you the story about why we did it, how we did it, and what we learned in the process of building it. But before we answer the question why, let's just talk a little bit more about what Chronosphere is, because most likely you don't know about it. So it's a hosted observability platform that is built to handle the scale and complexity of cloud native metrics. It's powered by M3DB, and M3DB is a time series data database that was built and open sourced uh, from Uber. It was battle tested there. And basically it's a really solid foundation that we have, and we decided to build our own observability solution on top of that. So when we're speaking about deploying Chronosphere, what does it actually mean, right? So we run all of our software in the cloud, and our clusters are managed by Kubernetes, and we run in a multi-tenant setup where for each paying customer of Chronosphere, we have a completely separate Chronosphere stack. And we model them in the Kubernetes world as separate namespaces. And then in each of these tenant namespaces, we deploy a bunch of stateful and stateless services that basically build up a Chronosphere product. And then for our stateful components, such as M3DB, M3 Aggregator, which are part of our time series database solution, for them, we have custom Kubernetes operators that help us uh, automate a lot of different operations for managing the database cluster. Uh, and basically, when we deploy software, usually people don't deploy just one service at a time. Each engineering team's team owns a subset of services. We call them a group of services. And then each team decides uh, the release cadence, the release validations, and basically take off with their release process that they have. And one thing that we're noting, since Chronosphere is an observability and monitoring platform, uh, we use our own product for monitoring our stuff. So basically all the dashboard, all the alerting, everything that we have that is in our own product. And one of the things that was important for us, the deployment tooling can kind of integrate with that. So if we go back in time two years and look at how we did deploys back then when we were just really young and excited to deploy stuff to prod as fast as possible. So we built a simple CLI command and basically the engineer would call it and say, I want to deploy this subset of services to one tenant. What the CLI would do, it would uh, connect to our production environment, compare desired state with existing state, generate you a diff of changes, show it to you in the output of the command, and then you can get the chance to kind of review it. If everything looks okay, you say, okay, let's proceed with the deployment. That same CLI connects to the cluster and just blasts out the changes. But can you actually consider that deployment is done after you completed this command? Of course not, right? So this is when you as an engineer have to do all the dirty work. First of all, you want to know, did my changes apply, right? So you will probably use kubectl and go and find the services that you're deploying, check that old pods are being killed, new pods are coming up healthy. Hopefully you deployed a really healthy change, everything is great, but still quite a bit of manual things you need to do to verify that it actually got there. Then the next thing that you would probably want to do is go to your favorite dashboards and Chronosphere product and check, is everything looking okay? Is CPU suddenly spiking through the roof or error rate is increasing? Hopefully everything is fine there as well. So then you look at the alerts, you look maybe at PagerDuty and check that there's no incidents that started after that. Uh, you started the deployment, you wait for some time, five to 10 minutes, let's say. Eventually you decide, yes, we deployed this tenant, everything is healthy, everything is fine. And then the worst part of it all is now you have to repeat all of this from the beginning for each tenant that you have. So 
if we look what, what was good about it, at least some minimal automation. And at least you can deploy changes to a group of services. Uh, you don't have to change each individual resource. Like, at least move in a little bit in the right direction. And one other thing that was nice, that users were able to review the diff as part of this flow. But then let's talk, talk about all the bad and the ugly. The main problem of it all is that users own monitoring of this process, because basically you as an engineer, you have to decide uh, is deployment successful or not, when is it actually completed, when do we decide to roll back, and in order to do that, you also have to switch between multiple tools, which, like, let's be frank, nobody likes that. Nobody likes opening five windows and stressing out whether things are going well and switching between all of them. And that was made even worse that you have to repeat it manually for each tenant. So in the beginning, when you're a young, excited startup with three clients, you're fine. But as your business becomes more successful, that is becoming more and more painful. And together with that, rollbacks are becoming more painful as well. Because, again, it's up to you to decide whether we need to roll back, and then you need to remember who did you roll out it to, how do we quickly undo all the changes, and it's really stressful, monitoring rollbacks is stressful, it was not really a sustainable way to continue. And then another thing that was a bit annoying, is that basically we had to give full production access from all engineering machines in order for that CLI to work, and we didn't really want to have that. So as we were growing as a company, we knew that like, we can't continue like that and we need to make some improvements in this process. So this is when we had to answer the question to build or not to build. And before we answered that, we decided to first gather some requirements to what do we actually want from a deployment experience that we want to have. So it was important for us that it's easy to model our Kubernetes setup with namespaces and services and all of that. We wanted to be able to have additional like, custom health checks during the deployment. One really important bit for M3 components, since we had those operators, we wanted to have integration with them because we wanted to reuse all of that functionality that we had for managing the database cluster. And then all the basic stuff, you want to be able to track the progress of your deployment, you want to get a clear signal when something goes wrong. Then since we use Chronosphere for monitoring, obviously we wanted to be able to integrate with our product, have some integration with logs to, for debugging purposes and checking that things are going well. And if we would go with a hosted solution, we wanted to make sure that the vendor access to our infrastructure is as limited as possible because we didn't feel comfortable giving them full access. And back when we were trying to answer this question, that was the end of 2020. So we reviewed a bunch of uh, um, open source solutions, a bunch of hosted solutions, and we didn't really find anything that would fit our use case really well. And at that point, since we had a pretty clear list of requirements, we decided, like, let's, let's see if we can actually build this, right? So now let's talk about how we actually build it. So first, then, the, that is worth mention, mentioning, that deployment process from the way we were seeing it in Chronosphere was a pretty well-defined sequence of steps, which makes it pretty easy to express as a workflow. And previously, we used Temporal for automating other workflows. Uh, for testing and other purposes, so we decided that maybe we can just use the same approach here when building our deployment system. So what is Temporal? It's an open source platform for reliable workflow execution. Basically, you write a workflow in your language of choice with the help of Temporal SDK. Then you spin up, uh, spin up workers being able to run that code, they connect to a Temporal cluster, and then when you schedule a workflow, Temporal will take care of making sure that your workflow is executed in a proper manner. And in case some intermediary failure happens and your workflow kind of experiences a failure in the middle, then Temporal will reschedule it on a different worker exactly from the spot where it failed. So this way you're kind of a little bit more resilient to failures. So this is how we structured our deployment workflows at a high level. So the first workload that we had was deploy service. Does exactly what it says in the name. It deploys one service. Applies the changes, waits for them to complete, or fails otherwise. Then the next level was deploy tenant workload that is responsible for deploying changes to one single tenant. It would initiate multiple deploy service workflows and wait for them to complete, figure out in which order they should be deployed, and then perform additional monitoring. For example, it would check whether any of the critical alerts went off since you started a deployment and wait for maybe five minutes after deployment completed. 
And then the high-level orchestration workflow is responsible for deploying multiple tenants within a cluster, deciding how fast do you go, how many tenants at a time do you deploy, if something goes wrong, how do you handle failures, how do you handle, ro handle rollbacks. So let's look a little bit more how user flow changed from this, right? Engineers would still use the same CLI, just a different command, but now you would be able to say that let's deploy these services to a bunch of tenants, or maybe even all tenants in the cluster if you want to. But instead of connecting directly to our production clusters, this CLI would now talk to deployer service. As you can see, we didn't think twice about the name. We just call it the way we thought it's deploying. Let's call it deployer. And basically, a deployer would kick off the workflow and connect to all the systems that you need to connect to to perform the deploy, monitor it, and kind of take you through all the necessary steps. While you can still use CLI to track the status, you can use it to initiate rollbacks, cancel, or check history of deploys. And then if something goes wrong, you would be notified through your Slack integration. So speaking of Slack integration, this is kind of how the message in Slack looked in the early days. I know it's a little bit scary and hard to comprehend, but basically what it normally says is like, in this tenant you experience this kind of failure with additional link to maybe alert that triggered the failure, and then it would offer you a choice of options of what you can do, right? You can either stop and abort the rollout and kind of investigate if it's your testing environment, you might want to check what's going on, or you can roll back. And this way, we kind of made rollbacks more accessible and easier to perform. If you're doing a multi-tenant deploy, you would also have options to roll back just one tenant, or roll back everything and just go back to the safe state of the world. So we rolled out the first version of deployer within like one or two months, gave it to all engineering teams, they started using it, and after we gathered some feedback. So what did people like about it? They liked that you were able to deploy changes to multiple tenants with one operation. It was a much nicer experience. But then it was nice to have automatic monitoring for checking that no alerts are firing or detecting whether the service actually is failing to start up. Honestly, in the beginning, engineers were a little bit skeptical at first, you know, as all of us are, and they would still open all the dashboards and check the alerts and do it manually. But over time, we gained their trust that our tool is doing the right thing, and most of the time, I think these days, people rely on the monitoring that we have inside the system. Uh, as I already mentioned, it's easier to initiate rollbacks. And another thing that we got out of the box now, since we were storing all of these workflows and the rollback history, you had access to the history of changes. So now if you're looking at different metrics and see that something went a little bit crazy uh, Thursday last month, you know, you can actually go back and compare it with what operations were performed at a time. Maybe you can connect the dots and play detective a little bit better with this tooling in place. But things were not perfect still, right? Another thing that we got out of feedback from people is that different teams actually had different requirements to how they wanted to perform deployments. Or as we were growing and getting more services and more tenants, duration of deploy started taking longer because one workload was responsible for it all now. And also, as number of tenants was growing, it was harder and harder for a person to actually track the progress of the deployment, given that we still had it in the CLI. So speaking of this last one, here you can see kind of a screenshot of how tracking the status of one deployment for two tenants and like nine services each, I think, looked like. So you can see it's a little bit already hard to comprehend and figure out what's going on. It's just a wall of text staring at you. And now let's imagine this for 10 tenants, for 20 tenants. This is not really something that we wanted to look at. And basically, this is when we decided that it's time for infrastructure engineers to become brave and learn a little bit of React and try building UIs. So this is what we ended up with. I know it's not pretty, but we tried our best. We used a lot of colors at least. And basically, the first version of the UI was just read-only, focused on two things. Finding your deploy, reviewing deployment history. Maybe you want to find something you deployed two days ago, or maybe deployments for a particular service. And then after you open a deployment, you would be taken to this other page that shows you the status of one deployment. And we tried to use more interactive components that we could afford in the CLI and basically use all the good tools that UI can help you. And yeah, after we rolled this out, I think engineers even who were a little bit skeptical about switching over to the UIs, they also eventually believed us that it's much nicer experience if you do it within your browser and have access to just better visualizations. So we built this first UI, just read only, got really excited about extending it. The next thing we decided to add to the UI is rendering the diff. So before I mentioned that we were showing the diff in the CLI, the way it worked. 
you would generate it in a temporary file on engineering machine and show it for like a few seconds and then you never see the diff again. Turned out that people actually want to be able to look at their deploy from a few days ago and see what exactly has changed. So it was a no brainer that this should be added to the UI as a functionality. So we got excited, we moved it to the backend, added support on the UI, rolled it out and thought everybody would be happy. But in the meantime, we actually heard developer experience because we didn't think it through a little bit. Because what happened? A person starts to deploy in the CLI, right? Then the uh, UI gets auto-opened with the diff. So you look at the diff, but then you need to be able to proceed and say like, hey, it's okay, I'm happy with this diff, let's proceed further. And for that, you will see like a Slack notification somewhere here. If you didn't disable Slack notifications because they're noisy, you need to find it in Slack, you need to confirm it, then you go to the UI again and you're trying to track the progress. And then if something breaks again, then again another Slack notification. So you're switching between three different views and just hating the day where you decided that you need to deploy something. So we heard it from basically the first days of rolling it out that this is not sustainable. So we quickly started prioritizing the work for moving all of this confirmation from, slow, or from Slack uh, to the UI. After we did that, the process became much better more streamlined, you start operation in the CLI, then you go to the UI, and everything happens there after all. Slack notifications are still working, but they're still kind of just a bit of a uh, support mode. And hopefully in the future, we will also move everything to the UI just to make it easier, but for now, this is kind of where we left it in the UI land. In scope of working on this project, we also did a lot of other interesting things. I don't have all the time in the world today to tell you all about it, so just wanted to quickly mention. So we provided more control over the speed and safety of the rollout, uh, prevented concurrent operations from happening, we added auto rollbacks on failure, generating release nodes, implemented more interesting operations such as persistent disk expansion and shrinking specifically for our storage components, and we were able to fairly easily add support for deploy freezes, which is kind of saving us during vacation and holiday times. So now let's talk about the lessons that we've learned as we were building all of this functionality. First one is that user needs are important. And I think if you're an infrastructure team and you're lucky enough to build tools for other engineers, you're in a really lucky situation because you basically speak the same language with your stakeholders and you can definitely use this to your advantage. And basically just talk to them, gather feedback from them, go through the operations that they're going through and experience the pain together with them. And then I'm sure together you can come up with a really good solution to the problems that they're facing. The second lesson that we learned is kind of connected to the first one. It's less is more. Because as you listen to your users and you uh, gather the feedback, you might get into a trap of implementing absolutely every suggestion that they have. But at the same time, you might impair the developer experience quite a bit. One case in point is basically the screenshot in the background. This is a help for our command for starting a deployment. As you can see, it like barely fits the screen and one needs like, I don't know, a magnifying glass to read through it, right? And for anyone who's been at the company for a while even, it's kind of hard to comprehend what's going on and assess all the uh, options that you can use when starting a deploy. Imagine if you just started a week ago and you're staring at this again. You, you will never want to do any deploys ever. Uh, next lesson that we learned was about visibility. Well, it's not that hard to build a solid solution for a problem that works fine most of the time. It's the last 5% that matter when something goes wrong. And we've noticed this, especially when deployments go wrong, it's really easy for us to say like, hey, it failed, go fix it, right? But actually, it would be a much better experience for people if they would have a clear answer, why did it fail? Or you can say, oh, the service is not starting up, but that is still, that is not clear enough. And this is basically the area where we can still do a lot of new improvements and kind of take it to the better level and provide kind of faster time to mitigate issues for people by just providing better visibility. Next lesson that we've learned was about reusability. Basically, as we were building out these workloads for deployment, we built a lot of small building blocks for interacting with different services, with Kubernetes, with our operators, with different storage uh, solutions. And later, when we were automating other operations, such as restarting services, different cluster operations, different end-to-end -end tests, we could reuse all of that. And I will, can confidently say that we will continue 
doing that moving forward as we're automating more and more operations with the help of Temporal. And the last lesson that we've learned was about dependencies. So when you build infrastructure level tooling, I think it's really important to remember that at some point, a lot of processes at the company might depend on your tooling. And the lesson about dependencies we actually learned during a global Slack outage, which was kind of silly. But basically, Slack had an outage, and if our deployment workflow wasn't able to send some kind of information level message to Slack, the deployment workflow would just fail and not allow you to continue at all. Which means if we're having an outage and we need to deploy a hotfix, we can do that because of the silly dependency. So fixing it was like half an hour kind of thing, but it pushed us to think more about how should we treat dependencies. And every time that we ended at dependencies moving forward, we need to make sure that do we actually need it? And how do we deal with it uh, when the thing you depend on is down? So looking back at the last two years, I can confidently say that building our own deployment solution for us was the right thing to do. But I don't think it's the right thing to do for everyone. In our case, we really needed this level of control and configurability, especially when we need to deal with our stateful components. And also our deployment flow is not that complicated and we don't expect it to get much more complicated. But I think for a lot of people, it's too much of a time investment. It's too much of uh, resources that you need. And we also face quite a lot of challenges by trying to get it right, trying to get the better developer experience. And we will continue working on this and improving it all and try to strike the right balance between providing reliable functionality and good developer experience. So thank you so much for your attention. I hope you found this somehow interesting and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, we have about seven minutes, so we can take two, three questions. Okay. I was just curious, what came before Droid CLI? I wasn't there to witness it, honestly. And I think from the beginning we started, we tried to do everything with uh, the CLI commands from the start. Maybe there were some gnarly shell scripts, most likely. That's what I suspect. <laughs> was, this, was this the first time your platform team built a custom CLI tool to do something? Mm, I think from the beginning of the company, we would always try to automate it as code and preferably testable code. I think any time that we needed to do anything, like we also build a lot of other things, like we have support for testing environments on demand for engineering. We automated a lot of that. So I think we had a lot of efforts in parallel. And I joined kind of when the company was, I guess, one year old, a little bit more. And I had a really strong impression that from the start, if we saw the need to automate, we would rather pay that price in the beginning. Even if it's not going to be perfect, it's never going to be perfect, right? We're still far away from being perfect. But at least trying to put, push the needle forward, I think that kind of was helpful. Thank you. I was interested in rollback. I mean, are all the tenants the same, or would you be in a situation where some of them deployed okay and others failed, and would you roll everybody back, or how did you think about rollback? Yeah, so we support both modes, and quite often, even when you deploy, you might be going from different versions, right, because someone will be lagging behind for some reason and things like that. So I think when it comes down to rollback, we try to provide more flexibility into if you have seen only problems in one tenant and you see everybody else is fine, and usually one of the tenants might be a snowflake, they have some special configurations that only triggered the problem. You can trigger only rollback for one, but I think in a lot of cases, for the safety's sake, if we're not sure exactly why it's happening, and normally you're not, right? A few minutes in, you're just panicking, shit, I can't release changes today, now I have to go back. I think most of the time we try prioritizing rolling everything back, but it depends again on the service. If it's stateless stuff, we would rather roll back everything. It's fast. If it's stateful stuff that can take hours, this is when we might make exceptions a little bit, but I think also then the teams are handling deploys a little bit separately and trying to figure out what is the best way for them to proceed. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Um, so we saw earlier uh, as well um, uh, T-Mobile 
trying to build platforms and uh, all platform teams that usually go more the GitOps way or operator pattern. So can you maybe elaborate on, uh, on, on this temporal tool and maybe alternatives which are kind of like more powerful to actually achieve this kind of deployments at scale, either for clusters or services which are running on top of clusters. Mm -hmm. And a follow-up question, have you thought about open sourcing this? Because it's, it's bringing a kind of like backstage experience for, for the SREs and the, for the infra teams. Yeah. Uh, so to answer the first one, I think there's just a lot of this custom functionality that we wanted, like for example, different ability to kind of confirm the deploys or for deploying our stateful components, we quite often like we run three different replicas and we, in the beginning, we would just like require manual confirmation between them and things like that. And as we were in early stages of the company, we really needed ability to have this control, right? And I think that would be harder to build in like maybe operator world, even like with the operators that we have from three components, we're struggling quite a bit and considering actually moving that to a workflow because it's a little bit easier to test. I think that's what we experienced. It was kind of hard while writing operators. And now we're actually trying to automate more operations and basically the deployer functionality is becoming a building block for it. So we would have something that would kind of detect what is the desired state of the cluster. Do we need to expand disks or do we need to expand the M3DB cluster and maybe shrink it? And basically then there would be logic that is doing this reconciliation loop and then it can use our deployment tooling as kind of a dependency to actually perform those operations. But I wouldn't be surprised if we decide to change it somehow. I think the struggle with the stateful components as well is that those operations take time and then you really need to be careful and I think there's more human involvement that is needed there and it probably will stay like that for a bit. And speaking about open, open source and we haven't thought about it yet because I think a lot of the code is like really specific to our setup. But maybe in the future, if you find something more general, I wouldn't be surprised if you do that. Um, yeah, I was curious on the on the rollback thing. Like, do you have any changes to like the data model or database scheme you have to deal with when you're thinking about whether to roll back? And if so, how do you handle that? Yeah. With the database, that normally only for our kind of stateless tier where we have to deal with that. And I think in general, we are trying to be very strict about the fact that we want all the changes to be kind of backwards compatible, that it shouldn't be really problematic. But yeah, migration story is still something that we need to improve on. And it's kind of like in general, I don't work just on deployment tooling, but on developer efficiency team where we work in a mode where we gather feedback from teams like what is the most painful to you right now? Let's prioritize that and then work on that. And we hear now that the um, kind of migration experience like is becoming more painful. It's only part of engineers at the companies that are affected by this and that team on their own was owning their interactions with the database. But this is definitely not covered by this here. It just comes with the assumption that nothing will break. But hopefully we'll figure out a better way moving forward. We know it's a pain point for sure. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Spartan words. You have two minutes. <laughs> I guess we have no questions. All right, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs>